Good day, everybody. Good to see everyone here today, and wonderful to see many of you whom I haven't seen for a while. Uh, it's good news, isn't it? Restrictions are being lifted. Things are, uh, we're doing really well here in the state. And, you know, those who are at home, please don't get used to just being at home doing church. Uh, when it's our turn, when it's your congregation turn, do make every effort to come. Because I, I reckon, you know, sooner or later, things will go back to kind of like a new normal. We would we do church in person uh, completely. So that's coming in the future. Uh, but for now, yes, we still have to do this. It's not ideal, but it's wonderful that we can be here. Uh, look, today's topic is a little bit awkward, isn't it? Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about sex, and it's kind of awkward to talk about sex, especially in public. Trust me, it'll be more awkward for me than it is for you. And uh, my wife, Deb, lives in fear of me using her as an illustration. Uh, so today, don't worry, there won't be any illustration about uh, my wife or my marriage or our sex life. But I have to say this, uh, we do live in a culture that glorifies sex on one hand and also confuses sex on the other. Uh, it places sex on such a high pedestal in our culture that it makes you feel like you are less than human if you are not having sex. Uh, think of jokes about, in our culture about virgins. Right? You're 40 and you, you haven't had sex ever? What is wrong with you? It's, it's funny. In our culture, if you've never had sex, it's hilarious. Uh, you are less than other people. And on top of that, we live in a culture that creates unrealistic and damaging expectations of sex. By the time most of us are teenagers, our minds have been bombarded with a skewed, a wrong, a damaging view of what sex is. And not just through pornography, just through mainstream culture. It has filled us with terrible insecurity on one hand. Am I going to be good in bed? Am I big enough? Am I this? Am I that? And on the other side, it has taught us to be selfish and self-centered. And worst of all, I think what this culture does, what our culture does, is it distracts us from what is most important. By putting sex on such a high pedestal, it distracts us from what is and should be most important to us. And our passage today, Paul aims to correct that. God wants us to know what is really important. Let me pray and give thanks to God before we looked at the Bible again. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you praise. And we know, Lord, we, know, we need you, we need the Spirit to be with us now as I speak and as all of us hear your word preached. Father, please, Lord, give us the humility to learn from you. Give us the humility to admit that we've been damaged by a culture, that sin has permeated in every part of our lives, and including our sex life, in our, in our view of marriage and, and singleness. And we do pray, Father Lord, that you be with us to correct us, but also to encourage us to keep us to strive for the most important thing. And we give you praise that Christ is with us as you promise always. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so a little bit of context um, to understand what is going on in the church of Corinth so that we can understand the passage that is before us. While some are incredibly sexually immoral, as we've seen from last week and the previous chapter as well, uh, some in the Church of Corinth, well, they live in the opposite extreme. Um, they view that sex is a terrible, sinful behavior. Remember, this is a church buried neck deep in the values and practices of its surrounding culture. So while some are having sex with prostitutes, others have adopted the view that sex is, sex is bad altogether. Uh, the only reason to have sex is to make babies. That's the prevailing view of some people. And if you are not making babies, you shouldn't be having sex, even if you are married. So have a look at verse 1. 
This is what verse 1 says. Now, we're listening to one side of the conversation, so we're trying to fill in the blanks and, and kind of guess how they're thinking, but it, one thing tells us very obviously is this, chapter 7, verse 1. Now, for the matters you wrote about, and this is what they said, this is what they wrote to Paul. It is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. That's what they have said to Paul. Isn't that right, Paul? Now, I want you to know literally that, that phrase, not to have sexual relations with a woman, literally it actually says not to touch a woman. Now, that word touch in that culture, in that context, is a euphemism. Uh, it's, it's a word that is used to explain not just sexual acts, but it's having sex for pleasure. So in their mind, in some people's mind, in that church at that time, Sex should only be for making babies, only for procreation. So husbands and wives shouldn't be doing it at all, unless they're trying to make a baby. Once you have a baby, stop. Don't have sex for pleasure. Now, they probably think that Paul believes this as well, because he's a single person. Uh, he is a celibate person, and Jesus, their Lord, our Lord, was a single person too. Paul never had sex in his life because he is celibate. Jesus, the perfect man, God incarnate, never had sex in his life too. So in their mind, they're probably thinking, well, they must agree with what we believe. And by the way, they don't get this from Paul, and they don't, certainly didn't get this from Jesus. They got this, this idea that sex is bad, it's only for babies. They got it from the prevailing culture. That's what some people believe at that time. But let me be clear, this is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't say sex is just for making babies. The Bible actually tells us that sex is good. It is appropriate and then it is a gift from God in the context of marriage. So you know what the Bible says to husbands and wives, to those who are married? The Bible simply says, go and have sex. Sex is good. Go and do it. Actually, it says more than that. It says if you are married, you have a duty, a responsibility to have sex with your spouse. Chapter 7, verse 2. But since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife, each woman with her own husband. You notice that? There's an obligation let me read on. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her own body but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body but yields it to his wife. Now, this is really counterculture, isn't it? This goes against the grain of our culture where our culture is all about personal rights and individualism, you don't get to tell me what to do with my body, this is my body, I must have freedom with my body. The Bible isn't about that. The Bible is about voluntary, willing, joyful service of one another. And if you notice, and this is really important to notice, this is mutual service here. It's not just saying to the wives, wives, you have an obligation to your husband, you know. You must have sex with him. Your body belongs to your husband. It doesn't just say that. It doesn't stop there. It goes the other way around too. Husbands, your body belongs to your wife. Use it in a way that serves her. So this is not an excuse for husbands to be domineering and demanding sex from their wives. This is a command for husband and wives to love and serve one another. And one very important way of serving one another is to have sex with one another. So husbands, please don't, after this sermon, start quoting this passage to her every time you feel like having sex. And don't demand from her what you want, because that, honestly, is just lazy leadership. It is terrible leadership. And I can tell you, if you do that, you will have the opposite effect. Don't worry about, uh, but Darwin, she might not know that this passage exists. Trust me, she knows. She heard it today. I've already told her. It's on her mind. 
Instead, rather than being a lazy, terrible leader that just throws Bible passages at people's face, expecting them to do what you want, rather than doing that, why don't you have a conversation instead? Why don't you have that really difficult conversation and ask what you could be doing to help your wife so that she would willingly and joyfully serve you in this way. Now, you might not like the answer that she gives, but you have to listen. A good leader means you would listen carefully without being defensive. Being a good leader means you care about your wife's feelings where she is at. Being a good leader isn't about, okay, I don't want to talk about it, then just put up a wall and just, I'll just live with it. I don't care and just begrudgingly be in a terrible marriage that you do not like. That's not leadership. Leadership is about changing yourself so that you can serve others. Wives, I know that I've been talking to the husbands, but actually the opposite could be true too. You could have a husband who is unwilling to serve you in this way, and I think the answer is the same. Have a conversation with your husband. Have a serious conversation. See, often, let let me say this, one more thing. Often, a sexless marriage, a a, a lack of sex uh, in a marriage is, is only a symptom of a deeper issue in a relationship. And you would probably have to go deeper to have that harder conversations about what's going on in your relationship, what is causing the lack of intimacy. Because it's not just the physical act, isn't it? It's two hearts connecting with each other. You are less likely to be physically connected if you hate each other's guts. So, husband and wives, listen to God's words today. Serve each other. Not just physically, though, but think hard about how you can reconnect how you can serve one another in your marriage so that you would be willingly, joyfully serve one another in this way. Okay, that's all I want to say right now. Uh, But if you've got any more questions, you can message me personally. Um, Paul does give... uh, You need to have sex with each other, but Paul does give kind of like an exception. There's, there's one reason why maybe you should stop having sex, and this might not be the, the only reason. There are plenty of reasons. Health reasons, you just, uh, you just had a baby, and, and all other different reasons. But here's one reason that Paul gives in chapter 7, verse 5. Do not deprive each other except perhaps, perhaps by mutual consent, and, and that's a really key phrase there, mutual consent. You both have to agree not to have sex with each other, and only for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. But I want you to know, this is Paul's preference. I guess he kind of gets it, you know. He, he, he knows that for him, sex is not that important. He doesn't struggle with sexual temptation. He doesn't have much urge of having sex. That's why he's a celibate single man. But he knows that not everyone's like that. So that's why he said this is a concession and not a command. Right? If, if, you, if, you're, if, if you want to continue on having sex and not stop so that you can pray, don't worry about it. It's, it's only a concession. I wish that all of you were as I am, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now, before we move on, let me just say that I want to really establish this truth, okay? Sex is good in the context of marriage. It is a good gift from God. It should be fostered. It should be enjoyed. It should be used in service of one another. But Paul actually doesn't just leave us there. There's something much more important than sexual fullness. Again, let me say this, as I said in the beginning, we live in a culture where you have to be sexually fulfilled, and that is the most important about humanity. This is, if you're not sexually fulfilled, there's something wrong about you being a person. But do you notice that actually for Paul and for the Bible and for God, 
there's one thing that's much more important than all that. Do you notice what it was? It was holiness. Did you notice the reason for Paul's commands? Husband and wives have sex with each other. He didn't say, husband and wives have sex with each other because you've got to be sexually fulfilled. No. The reason for all that is holiness. Because there's sexual immorality, don't go in that direction. Do this instead. Enjoy what God has given you so that you can be holy. See, this is the problem with our culture. It keeps us looking back at the wrong direction all the time. And Paul is clicking his finger, getting our attention, and telling us, get it right, guys. Get it right. Holiness is more important. It is more important than sexual fulfillment. It is more important than having a hot sex life. Remember the context of this book? Holiness is our destiny. It is our fate. This is, the, the, this is what Corinthians is all about. We have been set apart as Jesus' people, His holy people, and our pursuit towards holiness should be the most important thing. Much more important even than sex. And we need to use our bodies, our sexual urges, for the pursuit of holiness. And this is true even if you are unmarried. Your pursuit of holiness should be most important. If you are married, serve your husband and wives so that you both can be holy together. If you are unmarried, pursue holiness too. Now, remember Paul, for him, being single is best, and there will be more to say about this in the next half of 1 Corinthians 7. So I won't go into that too much, and that's for next week. Uh, For Paul, being single is best, but he realizes it's not for everyone. The focus is to be holy. And so, again, he says to the unmarried, now to the unmarried and the widow, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But again, if they cannot control themselves, again, the focus of holiness, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. More to be said about being unmarried and singleness next week. But here in verse 10, Paul goes back to those who are married. And it seems like they've asked him a question. Again, we're listening to one half of the conversation, right? But we can sort of gather that they asked him a question about divorce. Should those who are married, for one reason or another, divorce their spouse? And the answer, very simply, is no. Don't divorce your spouse. Let's read on. Verse 10. To the married, going back to the married, I give you this command. Not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate, divorce, from her husband. But if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. And a husband must not divorce his wife. They live in the culture uh, at that time, the Greco-Roman culture, where divorce is very common. It's actually much like ours today. Uh, In fact, one historian noted that Greco-Roman, ancient Greco-Roman marriage vows, their marriage vows at that time, they don't say, we're going to stay married until death do us part. They don't say that. It's almost expected that marriage will end in a divorce. We live in that culture now, don't we? I mean, our vows still say, until death do us part, and I think there's a romantic idea. It's a kind of leftover from from a Christian era. But now people are kind of suggesting maybe in our marriage vows we should set a time limit, and then we, we, we talk about it again after 10 years, whether we want to stay together or not. So our marriage vows should say we'll remain faithful to each other for a limited time period. Well, that's exactly what the the church in Corinth is going through as well. That's the life they live. Paul here is addressing no-fault divorce. Uh, You know, when celebs divorce, and then the reason they give is always, they they always cite irreconcilable differences. They call it a conscious uncoupling. Paul is addressing that. Don't get divorced for that kind of reason. 
uh, for Paul, for God, for the Lord, that is Jesus, that's not on. Yes, the Bible tells us that there are situations when the voice is permissible, not encouraged, but permissible in the case of adultery, for example, in, in adultery in marriage. So Jesus said these words uh, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, but I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for se sexual immorality, you get that exception? Except for sexual immorality, uh, makes her the victim of adultery, and anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. And again, 19 verse 9, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife except for sexual immorality, there's a clear exception that Jesus himself said. And there are other situations like abuse, and I won't go through it too much. But it's fair to say what Paul is addressing here is no-fault divorces. If your marriage is struggling, if you've fallen out of love, if you've fallen in love with someone else, don't divorce your spouse. That is not what God wants. And then he continues on. He goes into specific addressing those who, who are married to unbelievers. Uh, that is, people who became Christian after they were married. Uh, and it happened at that time, obviously, and it happens in our time too. It happens quite a lot. So the question then is this. Should they remain married to their unbelieving spouse? The answer to that for Paul is the same. Yes, stay married. Of course you need to stay married. Let's read on. Verse 12, to the rest I say to this, I am not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife, and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean, but as it is, they are holy. Now, you might be wondering what does that mean to be sanctified by their believing spouse? Let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It does not mean that the unbelieving spouse is saved or they have been saved from their sins. It doesn't mean that as at, at all, because if you look down at verse 16, it asks the question, right? It's an optimistic note, I think, uh, but it, it wonders, who, who knows that maybe one day they will be saved? That kind of means that they're not saved right now. Being sanctified here means two things, I mean, uh, I think. One is that the marriage is valid. You are married. This is a marriage in God's eyes. By God, this is a marriage. It is a proper legal marriage marriage, even though you are married to an unbelieving person. Uh, the second meaning is that, you know, if, if your unbelieving spouse being married to you means they have access to the Christian community. This is clean, unclean language that we find in the Old Testament. Remember, if, if, if someone who is unclean touches you, you become unclean, right? And if, if someone who is who cannot come into part of God's people's community because they are unclean and, and they touch you, you become unclean. If, if you're married to them, you become unclean. But Paul is saying, well, that's not true here. You being married to someone who is an unbeliever actually sanctifies them, makes them clean so that they can be part of the Christian community, even here on earth. So they are welcome to church. And that is why we baptize children, uh, even if we just have one parent who is a believer. They become included but it doesn't mean that the unbelieving spouse is saved. So to those who have unbelieving spouse, Paul says, don't divorce them just because they are unbelievers. But here's another caveat. Paul tells them if the unbelieving spouse wants to leave, wants to divorce them, verse 15, Paul says, well, let them. Verse 15, but if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. This is another reason, I think, where divorce is permissible. When your spouse divorces you, you don't want to divorce them, but they are insisting on divorcing you 
There's nothing you can do. Paul says, live in peace. You are not bound in such circumstances, meaning that you can remarry. You are free to remarry. Again, there's a lot of information there, but here's the gist of it. Don't get distracted. Know what is most important. Because our culture will want to distract us all the time. But don't get distracted. Know what's really important. One time, I, um, I took kind of like a day away, just by myself, uh, went to a secluded place to kind of just read my Bible uh, for the whole day. Just read my Bible and pray. So I, I, I thought of a place, I'm going to go there, never been there before. It's a secluded place. There's a beach there. Um, you kind of have to walk a little bit and to get to the beach. I thought, okay, I think I'll be secluded enough. I can sit by the beach, sit on the rocks, and just kind of focus on just reading the Bible and communing with God and enjoying that. So I got to my place, got there, walked a little bit, had a bit of hike, and got there. And I, you, you kind of have to walk through like a bunch, uh, uh, like a, a park, and then you get to the beach. And once I got to the beach, I realized, oh, no, it's a nude beach. Like, okay, all right, we can still make this work. I've walked all this far. I'm, I'm not going back again. I'll just, I'll just sit right there at the corner by the rocks by myself. And, and so I did. I, I went to the corner and, and, and sat there by myself, opened my Bible, and started reading. And then this guy, I don't know what he's doing, but he decided to just walk past me a few times. And remember, it's a nude beach. See, the world is like that. It's trying to distract you all the time. But don't get distracted. Know what's important. You see, often I think we get distracted about our life situations. We get distracted about whether you are married or not. We get distracted about being single and needing to change that situation. We get distracted about the situation of our marriage, whether this is happening or, or that's happening and wanting to change that and get out of that marriage so that we can be somewhere else. But for Paul, it actually doesn't, it's not that important. Let me show you what he's saying. Chapter 7, verse 17. This is a principle that we need to think about. Nevertheless, each person should live as a believer in whatever situation the Lord has assigned to them. Just as God has called them, this is the rule I lay down in all the churches. Each person should remain in the situation they were in when God called them. And then, jumping down to verse 24, brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God should remain in the situation they were in when God has called them. We live in a culture that makes much of whether you are married or not. And now there's a lot, let me just quickly say, there's, there's a bit about circumcision and being, uh, being a slave or being free. And Paul's just using that anal as, those things as analogies, okay? So I'm not going to focus too much on them. He's still, the context is still about being married or unmarried. We live in this culture where being married is seemed to be maybe of a higher status than if you are unmarried. Or sometimes it's the opposite. Being unmarried is of the higher status. And we always think about, oh, I'm still single, or that, that person is already married, or, or, or whatever it is. Don't get distracted by all those things because really they won't matter in six billion years. Don't be distracted away from the, matters, the things that matters the most. Notice what Paul says here, to live as believers, to follow God, to be responsible to God in whatever situation that we're in. That means if you are married, you have a responsibility to follow God, to be responsible to God, to be a good self-sacrificial husband in that marriage. That, that is your lot. Focus on that. Be holy as a husband. If you are a wife, be holy as a wife. Follow Jesus. Obey his commands. If you are unmarried, focus on that. Focus on following Jesus while you are unmarried. 
If you are single, there's nothing lacking in you. It doesn't matter that much if you are single in six billion years. If you never have sex in this life, it doesn't matter as much in six billion years. It won't matter. It will be a blip in history. I know it can often be really unhelpful even in, in the church culture. If, you've been, if you're not married yet, when you get to a certain stage, people start feeling sorry for you. People start wondering whether there's something wrong with you. They're starting to kind of feel like they have to match make you and uh, they're all just distractions. Don't be, distra- be distracted. Focus on the most important thing. The most important thing is following Jesus, being holy in whatever situations that we are in right now. Living in holiness. That should be our focus. And there's good news here. If you look at verse 24, it says, Brothers and sisters, each person as responsible to God. If you read the ESV, uh, it translates a bit more literally. It actually says, Brothers and sisters, each person um, should remain in the situation they were in when, they were, when God called them. Let him remain, it says, with God, rather than be, as you are responsible to God. It says, it says, let him remain with God. And I think that's great news. That tells us whatever situation that we find ourselves right now, whether you are married or unmarried, God is with you. Right now, that is the place God wants you to be, and He has not left you. Yes, there is much to grieve on when you desire to be married and, and you can't, or you desire to have children and, and you can't, or whatever situation of life you find yourself in, you want a particular job, but you can't, or you want to live in a particular place, but, but you can't. Those are good gifts from God, but let's not get distracted by those things. Let's not get distracted by the things we do not have. Let's not be distracted that we forget to do what is most important. That is to live holy lives, obeying Jesus in whatever situation we find ourselves in. See, whether you get an apple or you get a Nintendo Switch for your Christmas, you know it doesn't matter in six billion years. The same is true in this situation too. Whether you are married or unmarried, in the end it won't matter very much. What matters is living in holiness with God. Let me pray and give thanks to God. Father, we give you praise that you are a kind and generous God who speaks to us. Lord, please be with us as we strive to follow you. As we look towards living in holiness in the situation that we find ourselves in. For those who are married amongst us, please help us, Lord, to serve our spouse well, to to focus on holiness, to make sure that we can live holy lives and to make sure that our our spouse can live holy lives too. Father, where there is conflict in relationship, we, we pray, Lord, that we can work those things out with much humility. Please take away our defensiveness. Please help us to listen much and speak less. Help us to understand the other person. Help us to put ourselves in their shoes. Help us to love them the way they feel loved. And to those of us here who are unmarried, help us pursue holiness too. Whether we are dating or not, help us pursue holiness, for that is the most important thing. And thank you, Lord, that you are with us in whatever situation we are in. We give you praise, Father. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, if you've got questions, um, you can ask me those questions.